Well, thank you for coming out. Um, my session today is going to be, like the screen says, on identity management and compliance. We're going to talk a little bit about um, why do you care about this? Why is identity management important to compliance? Uh, and why I broke it out from, say, what we folks typically talk about compliance. And what is compliance? I know the first time I used to work at an audit firm, someone asked me, you know, is this compliant? Have you taken compliance into account? And my first question was compliance with what? So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, how does it apply, uh, it being identity management to appliance, uh, compliance? Um, and we'll talk about some real life workflows. Uh, and then finally, we'll get into some tech stuff and a demo. Um, any questions, please hold till the end since it's a pretty short session. I want to get through all the, the fun stuff first. So who am I? My name is Mark Borstein. I'm the CTO of Tremolo Security. Uh, we are an identity management company. I have been doing identity management for close to 15 years. Um, you name the industry and the product before I started Tremolo, pretty good chance that somewhere in that cross section I've done a deployment. Uh, I also spent time as a uh, FICAM architect, that's in the federal government what they call identity management. Uh, for multiple three-letter civilian agencies and have had to work a lot in the compliance space, especially with the feds. Uh, and if anybody has worked on uh, OpenID Connect with Kubernetes, uh, I contributed a lot of the documentation around OpenID Connect. All right, so why is compliance important? So there are two reasons why compliance is really important. The first is it will often be used against you. If somebody doesn't want you to put something into their environment, the first question is, is it compliant? Um, whether or not it has to be compliant is a little bit of a squishier subject, and it really depends on whether or not people want things in the environment, but when you're trying to push something, a new disruptive technology, I think we'll all agree that Kubernetes is pretty disruptive, um, it's always good to have the compliance question in your back pocket. The happy path, which I'm going to spend more time on today, uh, is this mathematical equation I like to have where if you take DevOps and identity management, you put them together, you make everybody happy. You make the suits happy because guess what? They don't like pouring through 10,000 emails any more than you like putting them together. And it makes your admins happy because there is nothing more annoying oops, than uh, having to answer tickets and add users to groups and have users who can't get into what they're doing get upset, complain to their boss, they complain to your boss. Um, so automation is really key. So what is compliance? So there are two types of compliance frameworks out there. There is the classic NIST 853, which is a true framework. So just like Kubernetes doesn't do anything unless you tell it to, uh, NIST 853 doesn't actually tell you what compliance is. It gives you a framework to design your compliance. So here we have a control. There we go. So this control here, the 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 step one, define your policy, will say, all right, you need to have a policy in this area, and then it's up to you as the implementer to define what that policy is. And then you have um, often much more industry-focused compliance frameworks, uh, and they tend to be a little more prescriptive. Uh, so I do a lot of work with law enforcement, and so C just comes up a lot. So how does IDM fit into this? So if we're looking at NIST 853, uh, this is an actual control. Um, authorize access to the information system based on 1A, act valid access authorization. That is an extremely helpful control uh, that is a palindrome. Um, so basically what it's saying is you need to have a process designed to say why somebody should have access to it. And then from a technology imp standpoint, how do you implement that? That's where identity management fits in. And then looking here at CGIS, uh, this section deals with passwords, password complexity, how often you have to change them, et cetera. And again, that's where you want to have identity management. So let's talk about the unhappy path with compliance and no DevOps. Uh, everybody's gone through this. I need access to something in Kubernetes, whether it's a namespace, um, a cluster, or whatnot. I'm going to email my boss, say, hey, I need access to this. They forward it on to an admin saying, I approve it, uh, or the admin you know, sends an email saying, hey, do you approve this access? Admin gets told yes, goes ahead, creates the access. Maybe they're creating uh, uh, 
uh, role binding, maybe they're creating an object in a directory somewhere, a database, and then send you an email. And if everything worked according to plan, you have access. If it didn't work according to plan, then you go into this state of going back and forth with a sysadmin who really has better things to do. Then every year, every few months, whatever the, the uh, compliance requires, you go through the certification process. If the admin's really good at saving those emails, then they just package up the emails and send them. If they're not really good at saving those emails, that admin's not going to have a good day. Uh, trying to go through all those emails. Even if you're using a ticketing system, um, you know, Remedy, ServiceNow, you're still digging through a lot of information to get to what the auditors need. So nobody's really happy with that. So here's the happy path when you, when you take DevOps and identity management, you put them together to do this. User logs into a portal, ask for access to something. Identity management figures out, hey, this is the workflow that has to happen. This, you know, the manager has to approve it, and the, the namespace owner has to approve it. User goes ahead, gets notified that it, it, the request is out there, the approvers get notified, they log in, they approve it, it all gets audited, the user gets notified that they now have access. Notice there's no admin anywhere in there, because the admins have better things to be doing than giving users access. Then when it comes time for the auditors to come along, here's a report. Everybody's happy. The users are getting into their systems. The admins are not dealing with user stores and user permissions and, well, users. Um, and they don't have to deal with the auditors. Everybody's getting what they want out of it. So let's talk a little bit about technology. How does this actually work in Kubernetes? I break identity management down into who, what, and why. Who are you? What can you do? Why can you do it? So the who is where the most uh, existing implementation is inside of Kubernetes. And so that's typically authentication. You have certificates, uh, you have OpenID Connect, and reverse procs are really the big ones, and then custom. Uh, I am not a huge fan of certificate authentication for Kubernetes. And the reason is a few fold. One, certificates are really easy to do poorly, really hard to do correctly. Uh, Kubernetes does support CRLs now, um, but in order to do group authorizations inside of a certificate, you've got to embed it into the DN, uh, and that can get messy, especially if you have long-lived certificates. And then from a compliance standpoint, one of the things that's really important with compliance is you want to do as little as possible. You want, some, you want as much to be someone else's problem as you can. And when you're talking about compliance of credentials, if you own the credential, you own compliance for the credential. You have to have all the controls in place to make sure that the credential gets revoked, that you're managing it, that if it's privileged, you're handling it properly. Whereas if somebody else owns that credential, that compliance is also somebody else's problem. You just say, go talk to your identity provider. So with certificates, you actually own the credential. So that's issue one uh, from a compliance standpoint. From an operational standpoint, in order to do certificate-based authentication, you need a point-to-point -point connection, which means no inspection of the content going across the wire. Um, you do reverse proxies, but you're, you're proxying network traffic. You're not looking at the information. So if you have a web application firewall in place, you can't do that. Um, now, you might be able to make the argument you don't really need or shouldn't have to have a web application firewall in place for the Kubernetes API server, and I probably agree with that, to be honest. Uh, but again, going back to compliance as a weapon against your implementation, that is yet another argument you have to have. So it's uh, a few of the reasons why I'm not a huge fan of uh, certificates for Kubernetes. Um, OpenID Connect, this is my personal favorite. I'm a big fan of the way Kubernetes implements it. Uh, because you can generate these short-lived tokens that last 10 seconds, 30 seconds, a minute, and be forced to refresh them. You can also embed authorization information into the token, which is what I'm going to show here. Um, so it covers you from the standpoint of you are now not issuing individual credentials to people, so you don't have to manage passwords, you don't have to manage um, revocation of those passwords. Um, and you, you, so from a compliance standpoint, that helps cover you. Um, anybody who's familiar with NIST 863, which is the federal government's kind of recommendations for authentication, 
Uh, the latest revision that came out a couple months ago now includes OpenID Connect. Um, so if somebody comes after you for that, you're covered. Uh, and so you have a lot more flexibility. It works well with any kind of network infrastructure that you have, um, and it's pretty common out there. Uh, reverse proxy plus header, I'm not a huge fan of either because um, raise the hands, beyond corp, anybody heard of it? Concept is the zero trust network. You don't let anybody, you know, you don't trust anything on your network. Your network is not trusted. You just assume you're breached and somebody's in there. Uh, so now you have your API server, if somebody's inside your network and just start injecting commands because they can inject headers that are not verifiable, that's really not a lot of fun. Uh, custom, to be honest, if your solution is custom and you don't have a cloud, I would really think long and hard about it. Because um, most of the people I talk to when they start saying, well, I just want something simple, and you start kind of going through and iterating all the things you gotta think about, they basically have OpenID Connect. So that's the who, who are you? The what, what can you do? So in Kubernetes, that's done via RBAC. RBAC is via from 1.8, 1.8 or 1.7 is now the standard of how you do it. And it's a pretty actually straightforward process. <clears throat> you combine a subject, who you are, a role, which is a, a description of uh, a collection of actions, you know, verbs and nouns, um, and a role binding, which is taking that role information and binding it to particular users. And then you have the same thing at the cluster level. Uh, a lot of people will use the role bindings as de facto groups. Not a huge fan of that approach because it's really easy to add users to that. Um, what's, whoops, thank you. Um, what's a little harder is doing the reverse. Hey, what does Mark have access to? New functionality is coming in for that, but quite frankly, there are a lot of tools that are really good at doing that outside of Kubernetes. I like to do as little work as possible. Uh, and then finally, the why. Um, Kubernetes has nothing that does that for you. You need something to track why someone should have access, and that's where you start to get into identity management systems. So we got a demo for you. Um, and so what we are demoing here is Open Unison, which is our open source project. Uh, you can do this a lot of different ways. Um, so uh, I have seen people do similar things with Jenkins. I have seen people do similar things with Bash scripts. Um, so there, the, this is by no means the only way that you're ever going to be able to do compliance. Uh, but this is an open source project. Source code is gonna be uh, uh, referenced here in the slide. And what we're doing is we're using the um, Open Unison, what I call the Identity Manager for Kubernetes. So it's a version of uh, Open Unison that we have uh, put in features specifically for managing Kubernetes, um, runs inside of it. And so what we have here is, probably a little easier if I come over here. Uh, so we've got a Kubernetes 1.8 cluster. Uh, it is running Open Unison as a container. And we have a relational database, uh, it's actually not running inside of Kubernetes, um, but it is storing our audit data and it's also storing our authorization data. Uh, so common issue in identity management is organizational. People who own the identity data are not the same people who need to use it. If you need to read identity data from AD, ADFS, whichever, that's usually relatively easy where things become harder is you need to write to it. And you know, think about it, those are the keys to the kingdom. Uh, you know, that's your company's entire infrastructure, especially if you're on the enterprise side. Um, so they're paranoid for a reason. Uh, so what we are doing here is we're saying, all right, we're not gonna connect directly to your AD, we're gonna use um, SAML2 to authenticate via ADFS. And because this is a compliance talk, I thought it'd be a little fun to add multi-factor. So we are going to show how we do multi-factor with OpenID Connect and U2F tokens. How am I doing on time? I'm doing okay on time. Okay, let's do it. So I'm going to go ahead and start off by logging in as a new user. So you can see I'm being bounced over to ADFS. And uh, 
my little token here. This is a Yubico U2F token. I think they're like 15 bucks. And DUser2 at Ent2K16. Okay, there we go. So what's happening now is that the assertion has all the information about the user, first name, last name, email, etc. I'm being asked to register my token. Now, anybody who uh, actually does work with compliance, first thing they're gonna say is this is technically not valid two-factor. Um, because if registering the token is not done with two factors, then using the token is not done with two factors. Uh, I would have had a second factor for this, such as SMS, which technically is deprecated by NIST 863, but still available, maybe by email. So some other trusted way to do it. I have 35 minute demo, I wanted to keep it a little straightforward. So uh, at this point I have registered my token. And so now, bounce back to ADFS, I'm gonna tell Yubico, hey, I'm here. Oh, there we go. Uh, this is the Oso uh, valid uh, banner. You know, I, I solemnly swear I am up to no good that uh, you're gonna have to click to, to acknowledge that you should do no harm. And so now I'm in. So this is Scale.js. This is our front end. Uh, everything is API driven. And you'll see I really don't have a lot of access to anything. Um, I'm a user. Here's my information. If I want to request access to something, uh, for instance, I want to become a namespace administrator, what we're actually doing is pulling this information directly out of Kubernetes. So as we add new project or namespaces, um, they'll show up here. So you don't have to create new workflows every time you onboard someone. So the first thing I'm going to do as uh, this user is I'm going to ask for a new namespace. Great thing about Kubernetes, it's all API driven. So if I want to create a new namespace with identity management, I've already got the workflow engine and the connections to do that. So I'm gonna go ahead and create a new namespace called user sandbox for demo. So that request has been submitted. And then again, this is where the DevOps plus identity manage, uh, compliance makes life better in identity management. I wanna see my open request. I'm sorry boss, I can't do my job because this guy Matt Mosley hasn't approved it yet. Let me go bug the him. So I'm gonna log out and log back in as Matt. How am I doing on time? Beautiful. So I'm gonna log in as our super administrator. And my second factor. And you'll see I have this open request for DUser2. So I'm gonna review the request. This person wants his own sandbox. I'm gonna say, okay. Now, um, if I go here to my reports, I can see approvals completed by me. And guess what? There's the request by demo user. And then if I wanna go see the audit reports, uh, change log for period. And then I'm gonna go ahead and do today. And there we can see, for instance, there's the uh, U2F data. And then if I come all the way down here, I think. Here we go. Here are all the objects being created in Kubernetes for DUser2, so that's now all audited. Um, and then the next thing I'm gonna do, because I forgot to do this when I requested it, is he needs access to my, san oops, my sandbox as Mr. Mosley. So I'm going to go ahead and request access on his behalf. So I'm gonna go request access, namespace administrators, and where's Matt Mosley? Right there. And I'm gonna say for demo. I'm gonna request for someone else and you can customize when this happens. I'm gonna do a pre-approval, approved. Now, if I requested this, but I was not a valid approver, the request would go through, because I can't, it's dynamic, so I can't figure out who's a valid approver up front, but the approval would fail, and it would be logged that it failed, and that I was the one requesting it. So I'm gonna go ahead and submit that. So that was already pre-approved, so I would not get a notification to go ahead and approve it. So at this point, our D user two 
is going to be able to log back in. And we're going to see a couple of new badges here on the front. So I have access to the dashboard because now I have something in Kubernetes worth accessing. I have access to a token. So first if I go to the dashboard, as of uh, one seven, I think, the dashboard now supports authentication. My favorite way to do that is via reverse proxy. We just inject your OpenID Connect token right in, and it then takes that and passes it along to the API server. So whatever you as the user can do, dashboard can do, uh, and it does it on your behalf. Um, it's not quite there where it's, it's like you can see that it's complaining that I don't have access to do certain things, so it's not quite um, intelligent enough to preempt those things. But um, if we come down here and I say go to my sandbox, you'll see I no longer have any error messages. And then, whoops, the other thing that I'm gonna to wanna to do is actually start doing some work. So uh, when we talk about OpenID Connect and tokens, the thing to realize is that you need to tell Kube Control what your token is, and then you need to tell Kube Control how to refresh that token. Uh, you want short-lived tokens, especially if you're embedding identity data and authorization data into those tokens. So I like to scope my tokens at a minute, and what we have here is just a giant Kube Control command that gets generated for me to be able to uh, update my kube config so I can go ahead and start working with it. And what kube control will do here is start um, refreshing tokens as they expire. So uh, the nice thing about this approach is we've separated out your authentication from your, from your kube control access. So we're authenticating via SAML, but we're still using OpenID Connect. Can everybody see that? Okay, cool. So I'm just gonna go ahead, set that up. So I am now uh, not able to get all because I'm D user. So let's do D user to sandbox. No resources found. So let's go ahead and uh, deploy something. Uh, run Nginx image uh, 192168. So, and then uh, D user to sandbox. So that's up and running. If I do get all, you can see we're off to the races. Now, I was also authorized for Matt Mosley. So I'm gonna go ahead and do the same thing, but this time I'm gonna run it in Matt's project. So now we're off to the races there as well. So um, Matt's, says, okay, you, you've, you've done Mosley, M. Mosley project. So, okay, cool, you figured out how to use this. I don't want you in my sandbox anymore. So I'm gonna go ahead and log out. Now, the other thing about uh, this session is, is it's actually tied to my web session. So once I log out and that token expires in about 35 seconds, uh, I won't be able to refresh it, even though technically the refresh token is still valid. So I'm gonna log in as Matt. And I'm going to go ahead and revoke demo user 2's access to my project because he doesn't need it anymore. And denied. So it's been pre approved, it's gone through the approval process and the workflow. Now, me personally, I actually really enjoy when I look at compliance reports seeing rejected, um, because that means people are actually paying attention. So if I go to the audit report and I see my completed approvals, 
All right. Is it on there yet? Uh, rejected demo user two, here we go. Not needed anymore. So now when I go and I log in, and even before I do that, just to show that there was nothing up my sleeve, at this point that uh, token's no longer good, we're gonna get a whole lot of unauthorized because I can't get a refresh token anymore. So if we look at my groups, you'll see that I don't have M. Mosley anymore. And if I do a get all on the M. Mosley project, I'm still gonna get that same uh, access denied. But, oh, wait, uh, home tokens, need to generate a new token here. There we go. So now you'll see it's forbidden because I don't have access. But if I do the same thing on my own, I'm still able to access it. Um, so that's the demo. Let's go back into present mode. Should have just enough time for some questions. So a couple of useful resources. Um, and this is up on the uh, slide. Uh, uh, entry uh, on uh, Shed. Um, Podcuddle pod episode 15, a couple of weeks ago, uh, my mom thinks that the presenter was really smart. Um, talking about identity management in Kubernetes, uh, the actual authentication page on Kubernetes has a lot of detailed information, uh, pictures on how that sequence actually works. Um, this is a really great link for a blog post on how the CAs in Kubernetes work. Uh, if uh, you, know, you really want to understand how the different certificate authorities work and, and how that all fits in. Um, and then this is a link to the original uh, blog post that I wrote. When I actually wrote this originally, it was for OpenShift. Um, the folks at Red Hat put together a really nice compliance framework and everything that had to do with identity management was go talk to someone else, so I wanted to provide a, that someone else. And a little bit of shameless self-promotion, you can catch us on the web. Uh, we have, here are my Twitter handles, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I love talking to folks. Um, here are the links to GitHub for the identity managers, and specifically the fork that I did that has the U2F support and the compliance page. Um, please feel free to, to ask for things, support, whatnot. Really happy to help out. And uh, with that, I went the wrong direction. Uh, I think that's pretty much it. So, uh, two minutes left. Any questions? Yes? So we're not actually, that's a great question. So we're not actually adding users directly to role bindings. We created a group inside of our database. And then in, when we created the namespace, we created the role binding and added the group to the role binding. So we don't have to update the role binding every time. We only have to update our internal group. So it gives us a level of separation. Exactly. So that way you don't actually have to go into Kubernetes every time that you want to authorize or unauthorize someone. Great question. Any other questions? Awesome. Well, thanks for coming by. <laughs>